So what's going on, everybody? My name is Jordan. I am one of the pastors here at Renaissance, where our mission is to connect people to Jesus Christ and to each other. And uh, I'm really grateful to be with you guys as we are on uh, Palm Sunday. Make sure you get one of those on the way out. Now, one of the most important things about everything you do in your life are rooted in expectations. In every single uh, relationship that you have, there is this invisible force that is driving, molding, shaping your expectations, and shaping the relationship, and how much joy and satisfaction you're getting out of that relationship. Expectations are really important because relationships are really important. Uh, everything that you're doing now is deeply rooted in the relationships that you have. And I'm not just talking about romantic, but with your coworkers, with your boss, with your parents, with your kids, with your friends, with your family members, everything is all about relationships. I've seen some people work at a job that they don't really like the work, but they love, that was one of my employees who said amen, that's really bad, no, <laughs> kidding. It wasn't, it wasn't. They work at a job that they don't really like the work, but they love their, uh, their coworkers or their boss, so they'll stay there longer. I've also seen the opposite where people uh, love their work, but they don't really like their boss or their coworker, so they leave. The kids are really excited right now. <laughs> One scream, you don't worry. Two screams, that's when you start to get a little concerned. Uh, and beneath all of these relationships that we need to thrive, that we need to enjoy the city, this church, our family, beneath all of these relationships are expectations. Unmet and unclear expectations are one of the biggest causes of frustration, sadness, and almost every negative emotion uh, you and I can experience. Cu couples split over unmet expectations. Holidays are ruined. One of the things that I talk to a lot with um, uh, young couples, especially young married couples, is one of the biggest killers of intimacy and connection in their relationship is that both of them have come into this relationship with these expectations. And when they don't happen, it kills their relationship. It starts to erode away at their connection with each other. And um, if you really think of an area that you are frustrated or disappointed in right now, I bet you that beneath that frustration, beneath that disappointment, is an unmet expectation. Now, here's the problem in fixing our expectations. Uh, oftentimes, we don't even realize that we had an expectation until someone doesn't meet it. The first problem with our expectations is that they're often unconscious. We don't even know what we're expecting people to do until they don't do it, and then we get mad at them for not doing it. Uh, case in point, some of you are big gift givers. You love to go shopping for gifts. You spend, you're one of those people, you start shopping for Christmas in August. And you go out of your way to find the perfect gift for people. Uh, you make sure that it's thoughtful, not too expensive, in the, uh, something that they don't already have. And you spend time and uh, you'll travel to a place uh, to get their perfect gift. And then you give it to them that Christmas morning. And everybody in the whole room just says, oh, man, that is, that is a fantastic gift. When it's their turn to give you a gift, they hand you a Visa gift card that they clearly just got from Dwayne Reed on the way over to your apartment. Now, you could be disappointed, and you might be disappointed, and what, what's beneath that disappointment? It's this expectation that everybody should give the same kind of gift. So since you're given a really thoughtful gift, since you've gone all out of your way, you're just expecting them to do the same thing, even though you didn't even know that's what you were expecting. Uh, we often don't realize that um, we have expectations until someone does not meet them. Now, not only are our expectations unconscious, but sometimes they're just flat out unrealistic. Uh, we get upset for, doing, for people not doing things uh, or behaving in a certain way when it's not even realistic that we put that expectation on them. Now, we are getting close to one of my favorite seasons. It's cookout season, y'all. It's coming up. Yes. And let me spare you some unnecessary frustration and disappointment if you come to one of my cookouts. It might say it starts at 2, but the food ain't going to be ready at 2. <laughs> I don't care what it said on the email, the evite, the eventbrite, the text. It ain't start At 2, 
we're just coming downstairs. <laughs> At 2.30, we just put the hot dogs on the grill, but the buns ain't coming until 3. So really, if, if you want to eat, there's a good hour built in to that. Now, in my entire life, no cookout in my family has ever, for any reason, started at the time they said it was going to start. Let me help y'all. This is a diverse church, y'all. Let me just, <laughs> let, me help, let, me, let me translate. Two things you can't do. Number one, no raisins in the potato salad. That's rule number one. It's a, it's a rule. Just please Google it. Number two, if it says two, they mean four. If they're Caribbean, if it says two, they mean nine. <laughs> if you show up to the cookout at two hungry, that's on you. <laughs> Why is that? It's not realistic to expect something that has never happened before to be done. <laughs> you know, it's funny with the cookout. But in our relationships, we oftentimes have really unrealistic expectations of other people that make us really mad and frustrated at them when they don't behave like we want them to. One of my cousins was going through a tough time uh, right around the same time that my youngest son, my beautiful boy, Josiah, was born. And he would be texting me, and then like, if I didn't respond within a minute, he would text me back, hello, are you even there? And, you know, I would text him back days later, like, yo, because I haven't taken a shower, like, in four days. I don't even know what day of the week it is. The fact that I've eaten today in the last, you know, 10 hours is a miracle. We're in a semi-conscious state of sleep, sleep deprivation. Um, the last thing I n can do right now is respond to your text in one minute. If you expected me to do that, that's just not realistic. I don't even know where my phone is half the time, and the times I do know where it is, my hands are covered in diaper cream. I don't even, I'm not picking my phone up to text you, bro. In our relationships, a lot of times we've imported unrealistic expectations on people that there's nothing in their history that they've shown us that they can actually do, meet that or that they will meet that. And here's a problem with unmet expectations. The problem is not always them. As much as we would like to believe that it's them, that they're, doing the, they're the ones doing wrong, the problem oftentimes is us. We're putting on top of people unrealistic expectations. Now, not only are they unconscious and not only are they uh, unrealistic, they're oftentimes unspoken. There's so many things that we expect other people to do that we have never even asked or communicated to them. The least helpful thing two adults can do with each other is try to read each other's minds. The least helpful thing you can do with your coworkers, with your boss, with your friends, with your family, with your significant other, with your kids, the least helpful thing you can do is expect them to read your mind because they simply can't do it. And lastly, even if sometimes they're unconscious and unrealistic and unspoken, um, man, the last problem of expectations is that a lot of times they're just unagreed. They're things that the other person would not even agree to. Here are the thing with our expectations. They can never be demands. If they're a demand, don't go down this cycle with them. Uh, demands are one thing, you know, certainly with, with kids that are five years old, it's a demand to take a bath, right? They probably would go weeks and weeks without it if left to their own choice. So not every single conversation needs to be an expectation. But certainly, there are so many times in life when we're frustrated and we're disappointed, and sometimes we didn't even know why we were frustrated or it's unrealistic, or they wouldn't even agree to this. Unmet or unclear expectations are a huge challenge to every single relationship, and it's not always the other people that are the problem. Maybe the problem is our expectations. Now, let me ask you guys a question. What do you think it would do to your relationship with God? if you had the wrong expectations of him? Could you have a thriving relationship with Jesus, a thriving relationship with Jesus, if you're operating on unrealistic or um, unrealistic assumptions or expectations that Jesus would never agree to in your life? Good expectations are conscious. We realize what they are. They're realistic. They're communicated, and they are agreed upon. These are the only expectations we have a right to hold on to. 
Have you ever thought about the expectations you have of God, of what God should be like, of what God should do in your life, what God should allow or should not allow for you? We're in a day known in Christian circles as Palm Sunday and this triumphal entry of Jesus coming in to town. And this is a day that you and I have an opportunity to realign our expectations of what we think Jesus uh, should do and who we think Jesus is. Spoiler, spoiler alert, he is not a type of figure that will operate based on how we think he should operate. And we don't want that uh, for our lives. Now, um, in this passage of Scripture that we're going to spend the majority of time in today, uh, we see that God does not meet people's expectations, or certainly not in the way that he wanted, that they wanted him to meet it. And this does not mean that God is not good and true and loving and faithful, but it does mean that you and I might need to zoom out a little bit and to reevaluate what it is, in fact, that we expect him to be like. It comes from the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter. It says, when they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus uh, then sent two disciples telling them, go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey there with her foal. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and its foal when they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in uproar, saying, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, the startling reality about this passage of celebration is that five days from this declaration and this praise for Jesus, the crowd that was chanting and shouting Hosanna would later be shouting crucify him. Others who followed Jesus and were there behind him and with him would desert him. Why would they do that? Because Jesus did not meet their expectations. Now, up to this point in Jewish history, 150 years before this, there was a Jewish leader uh, by the name of Judas Maccabeus, and he led a revolt uh, at a previous time when the Jewish people were under a different type of oppression. And after he led them to victory, the crowd celebrated by waving palm branches. And, by, um, and to commemorate the victory, uh, Maccabeus stamped the image of a palm onto their coins, which symbolized victory for the Jews over their oppressors. 150 years later, when Jesus shows, out, shows up, the Jewish people are again under foreign rule, and they're waving their palms in the air, shouting, Hosanna, which means, save us now. Now, they're saying something very significant to Jesus, much like what you and I would do um, is, is this. We're, in effect, saying, we want you to rescue us in the way that we think you should do it. But Jesus rescues us in ways that we do not understand through the surprising and apparent powerlessness of the cross. On Palm Sunday, the crowds wanted a good thing, which was deliverance from the power of Rome. But Jesus was about to deliver them something much bigger and better, the power of deliverance over sin and death completely. But Jesus didn't answer their prayers. He did not meet their expectations, at least not in the way that they expected. And once he did not meet their expectations, listen to this, he was of no use to them. Now, here's what we need to understand about Jesus. And this was what Jesus was doing. Jesus was coming to make us have to make a decision who he was uh, in their life, which was this. He is a king. And by coming into Jerusalem in that way, he was forcing the issue that they would either have to crown him or crucify him. 
but nobody could remain in the middle. Now, here's something so interesting that I found out about this scripture that I was reading through this week. Uh, Jesus did not just send for the donkey. He also sent for the crowd. So as the scripture is telling um, how Jesus gave instructions, he's saying, go into these two villages near Bethphage and Bethany, um, and they're going to walk from Bethany into Jerusalem. Why did he do that? Because Jesus had already spent so much time in these neighboring uh, villages and towns. Uh, Bethany is where uh, Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus were. So Jesus had already raised someone from the dead there. They knew Jesus' name. His name was good in Bethphage and, Beth and Bethany. When Jesus tells them to go and untie a donkey, they know the messianic uh, prophecies that when this figure goes in during Passover week into Jerusalem, this is a declaration of his kingship. So as soon as he called for the donkey, the entire crowd starts to go in, and this crowd was not even the crowd from the city. We know this because in verse 10 it says the whole city was saying, yo, who is this? The crowd that Jesus sent for was intentional to stir up everything because Jesus was forcing them to make a decision. You're going to have to crown me or you're going to have to kill me. But either way, you're going to have to decide. When we don't acknowledge Jesus as a king in our life, it brings with it a whole lot of disappointment and frustration and anger. There's so many ways that you might not be living like Jesus is a king. You might be living like Jesus is a great example. He's a great person to emulate. You know what's so strange about that? Literally nobody that came into contact with him thought that. They either, everyone had a very strong reaction to him. They loved him and they followed him, some until death, or they hated him and they wanted him killed. I think the modern day Americanized version of Jesus with um, flowing hair um, and dreadlocks, the one on 125th Street, It's always in this posture of him praying, looking up, to this, looking, looking up to the sky, and that's true. But we leave out when Jesus went into the temple and he turned over tables and says, my father's house, my house will be a house of prayer. Who else has that much boldness and that much um, gall, if it weren't true, to go into the temple and say, this is my house? Jesus forces us. And listen, when we don't live like Jesus is our king, if our expectation of him uh, is not that he's a king and he's going to do things much differently than we might want him to do, uh, then we're going to be selling ourselves short and our relationship with Jesus will be bound to be uh, laced with frustration and anger and disappointment. You know, I, I realize so often that I'm not treating like a Jesus like a king when I, when I worry. When I, I just wake up in the morning sometimes and here's what happens when I'm starting to worry it's usually because I believe at a subconscious level, but at a deep level nonetheless, that my life, my life depends on my ability to arrange situations. So when the situations get out of order, I start to worry. And I'm not living like he's a good and gracious king who can provide for me. Back in the day, they understood kings, that kings were the ones who provided for everyone in their kingdom. And if there was a lot of hunger, it was because there was a bad king. If everyone had plenty, it was because they had a good and benevolent king. This is why Paul says in Philippians 4 and 19, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. If I believe that, if I believe that God would supply all of my needs according to his riches, that he has uh, more than enough to go around, if you believe that, would you worry as much as you do? There's other times we don't treat Jesus like a king and we see this so often when it comes time to forgive someone, there was a, an interaction Jesus had with his disciples where they said, Jesus, how much should we forgive people? Seven times? Jesus says, nah, 70 times seven. Jesus wasn't doing this as a math lesson um, to teach them uh, new math or anything like that. Jesus was stretching the boundaries for, for them, that the limits that they had on forgiveness on who they thought deserved grace, how they deserved to receive that grace, theirs was limited. Jesus stretches that so far. You know why one of the reasons you and I might struggle so much to forgive people? Uh, because we don't think that they deserve it. And Jesus' command to us to forgive people rings hollow in our ears. We're treating him like an advisor, and that piece of advice doesn't make a lot of sense to me, or I don't like it, so I'm not going to do it. And in turn, we end up in our own prison of unforgiveness unable to move forward. 
Now, forgiveness does not mean excusing a situation. It does not mean pretending it didn't happen, but it does mean ourselves letting go of the hatred and things that we have pent up against the other person where we want to pay them back and we want them to suffer for what they've done to us. There are other times when we struggle to treat Jesus like a king when it comes to generosity, and we don't believe Jesus has any right to tell us what to do with our money. Other times, it comes down to our purity, and we don't believe Jesus has any right to tell us what to do with our body. If we don't believe these things, that Jesus is a king, and he's, uh, he has the right to tell us what to do in our life, and we are uh, a part of his kingdom, of, under a good king, a good and gracious king, our entire lives will be out of order. Palm Sunday is a day that you and I can have a hard look at our expectations of who Jesus is in our lives. Is he a king or is he not? Whatever you do, don't treat him like he's just another good guy because that's not how he even came into town to want to be treated. Now, the reaction to Jesus being a king and to not doing things the way that people wanted him to do, it was a very harsh reaction. And one was a reaction from the crowd, which is that they turned on him as soon as he didn't do what he wanted them to do. And, man, it was ugly. They went from shouting Hosanna to, to crucify him. And as I was thinking about it, I said, you know what? That's actually not that surprising because crowds are just that. They're crowds. There is a huge difference between who is with you and who is around you. Don't ever confuse the two. Just because you see someone in a lobby and they smile, just because you see someone, a roommate or whatever, there is a huge difference between who was actually with you and who was just around you. Ask MC Hammer uh, about that. Now, all my 20-something millennials, I hope and I pray that you know who MC Hammer is. Do y'all know who MC Hammer is? Because it's not going to make sense in two weeks when I wear my hammer pants. It's going to be awkward. Now, MC Hammer, I would have loved to hang out with Hammer in the 90s, y'all. Hammer don't hurt him. He was throwing the most epic parties. The dude had lions walking around. Uh, he was just, yo, throw it in a bag. It was all good to live and to hang out with MC Hammer because he was just constantly making it rain. What happened? His money dried up, and so did his friends. He learned a real lesson between those who were with him and those who were just around him. Now, there's actually a lot of studies now about athletes who are really struggling with uh, post-retirement life, and there's so many athletes who are struggling with anxiety and depression and drug addiction because for the first time in probably decades for some of them, they're having to readjust to life where not everybody in the crowds are all coming around them. They're learning that there's a difference between those who are with you and those who are just around you. Now, this crowd was just around Jesus, and they were only there. Here's what crowds are there for. They are there as long as you are useful to them. The second you are no longer useful to the crowd, they will not be with you. This is what we see in the life uh, of Jesus in this account. They were there only as long as he was useful for them. Now, most of you in here um, are, are not a part of the crowd, but some of you might just be reengaging faith for the first time in a long time. And here's what I want to do. I want to save you some frustration in your pursuit of Jesus. I want to save you a lot of heartache. Jesus will absolutely, at multiple points, disappoint your expectations of him if you have the wrong expectations of him. He will not behave in the way that you think that he should. Here's how um, uh, Augustine once said it. He says, if you understand God, then it is not God that you understand. If you understand God then it is not God that you understand. What's Augustine saying? He's saying all of us have this tendency to create this version of God in our own heads who makes sense to us. But the second you have done that, you have lost a grip and a grasp of the real God. But most of us in this room are not in the crowd. You're here because in some way you have committed your life to God. And as best as you know how, you're following Jesus. You stumble, but praise God, you're stumbling forward. Now, let's start with a part of the story that many of us are in danger of and we need to wrestle with. The saddest thing about the last week of Jesus' life is not the crowd that was chanting, crucify him. That's somewhat typical of crowds. They'll leave you in a heartbeat. The saddest thing about the last week of Jesus' life is not the crowd that chanted for his demise loudly, but rather his followers who deserted him silently. Matthew 26 and 56 says one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible that says this, 
Then all the, disciple, the, all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Now, we don't even get any detail of how they ran away because one by one, slowly, but definitely, they all went away. Now, don't judge them. We are all prone to drift away when Jesus doesn't act in the way that we want him to act. And to guard against that, you and I need to have the right expectations of him in our life. That in order for him to be good in our lives, he does not have to do things the way that we would want him to do. He is, after all, a king. And we need to fight to remain hopeful in times to trust that he is trustworthy. Uh, there's a scripture in the book of Revelations, and Revelation is not all about fire and brimstone, uh, but there's a letter to the seven churches, and Jesus tells us one church something that every time I hear it, it gives me pause. He says, I see your works, and they're good. You're doing a lot of good things, but I have this against you. You have left your first love. Now, this rebuke to this church wasn't about uh, a chronological order of love. It wasn't that uh, it wasn't about anything chronology or timing. It was that the thing that they once had, which was passion, heartfelt love, they were losing it. So they were doing a bunch of things for Jesus but didn't love Jesus. This is one of the, uh, the greatest rebukes that Jesus gives to the Pharisees. He says, yo, listen, you guys are whitewashed tombs. You're doing all of these things, but your hearts are far from me. The story of God is that God has come to us in the person of Jesus and because he wants a relationship with us. And so many of us can get caught in this trap of just doing the same thing over and over again, this performance treadmill, and we lose sight of the relationship. A lot of us can drift away from God just in the mundane, day-to-day -day things of life. Before you know it, nothing warms your heart anymore. You're just doing it just because you're, you feel like you have to do it but it doesn't really touch you. You don't feel like you have a burning love. You don't have an appreciation for, for Jesus anymore. That's a sign that you are drifting away from him. Other times, it's not just mundane moments. It's actually pretty uh, huge events in your life that really make you walk away. And sometimes you know it's happening. Sometimes you don't know it's happening. Uh, I've been a Christian for about 20 years, and I grew up in a Christian household. And there was a couple of times when Jesus so did not meet my expectations of him that I was so disappointed in him that I started to drift away and I didn't even realize it was happening until I was miles from shore. Uh, years ago, I I've told this story before, my late wife passed away and as I was recovering from just some of the shock and the, the anger of um, her passing away from cancer, I started to rebuild my life. And six, eight months, almost a year had passed and as I was rebuilding my life in so many other areas, I realized that I had stopped praying. I had gone weeks and sometimes months without praying once. Now, prayer to the life of a Christian is just like oxygen to our lungs. We need it to survive. We cannot have a thriving relationship with God without it. And yet, I was going months and months without it. And why did that happen? Jesus had so disappointed me, so lived beneath my expectations of what I thought he should allow in my life that I deserted him. Now, the good news for people who drift away, either on purpose or accidentally, is that Jesus is a type of king that goes after deserters. Jesus is not the type of king, like on Game of Thrones, that you have to come to his kingdom and beg and plead and crawl and grovel just to get to him. Jesus is a king that comes after you. In Matthew 21 and 5, it says it like this. We see it in the text. It says, tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. After the apostle Peter left Jesus and deserted him, he had gone back to his previous life of fishing, and he had quite literally gone fishing. Peter never returned to Jesus. Jesus went after him. In John 21, you see this account, Jesus um, comes into the house and says, where's Peter? He's outside. Jesus goes and he pursues him. Jesus is the type of king that goes after deserters. And he doesn't just come after us, but he's also gentle. Uh, there's a part of the text where it says that Jesus was riding on a donkey that had never been ridden before. And I don't know much about animals. I didn't grow up on a farm, but I do know this. You never want to hop on the back of an animal that has never been ridden before and think it's going to be all good. 
There's a process to groom animals to make them ready for it. Not just that, but Jesus was going to be walking in the middle of a screaming crowd. So Jesus is taking this animal who's never been ridden before through a procession of screaming people, waving things in his face, and his donkey is calm. Why is that? It's because Jesus' touch is gentle. The God that is coming after you, the Jesus that is coming after you, is gentle. Yes, he'll take things out of your hand, but it's not to harm you. It's to bless you. And many times, it's to save you from you. Now, how do we live in this reality? How do we more draw our affections toward Jesus? There's a scripture in the, in the, in the book of Jude. It says, but you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Look at that phrase, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Now, this scripture does not mean that it is up to you solely to love Jesus, but it does mean that there is a, a responsibility on our part to make sure that we are putting ourselves in front of the real Jesus so that we could be transformed by him. You cannot make yourself love anybody, but you can put yourself in their place. You can do things that will, uh, you can engage in rhythms that will make you love them. Actions of love lead to feelings of love. And quite the opposite, action, actions of hatred lead to feelings of hatred. There was a professor that did a lot of studies psychologically on how the Holocaust and slavery were able to happen. And if you study the beginning parts of both of these atrocities, you see that they didn't hate the Jews as much at first. They didn't hate black people as much at first. But years and years and centuries of continuous actions of hatred made them actually hate them. The same thing is true in our life in pursuing love. Actions of love will always lead to feelings of love. Jesus' call to us to be obedient is not to make our emotions feel something, but to know and to trust that our emotions will catch up to it eventually. So brothers and sisters, keep yourselves in the love of God. One of the ways we do this is by putting ourselves in front of the real Jesus and uh, one of the things that we've hoped for you as a community is that in this time leading up to Easter, we would go through this devotional. Um, and every single day, we would put ourselves in front of the real Jesus and ask to be changed by him, to have our affection stirred for him. Now, I won't make you raise your hand because everybody in this room would raise your hand how many times you've missed days. Um, my wife has missed six. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to put on <laughs> I've missed a couple of days, admittedly, and I'm the one who wrote it, which is sad. But this week, commit to reading it. If you don't have one, it's in the Friday email that we just sent out. There's a digital copy. You can read it on your phone. You can do, you can, there's so many different ways that you can do it. Set aside time to keep yourselves in the love of God. Another way that we keep ourselves in the love of God is this act that Christians have done for hundreds of years and thousands of years called communion. Uh, communion is a practice of remembering Jesus. Jesus gave us his command to do it as often as we do to what? To remember him. To remember that he's a good and gracious king that comes to us and that he's gentle. And he shows us on a cross what love looks like. Uh, he did it by having some bread and he, he broke the bread with his disciples and said, this is my body which is broken for you. And he took some wine, he says, and this is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness, for the remission, for the wiping clean of the slate of all your sin, of all your desertion. It's wiped clean. 